I wanted to start by welcoming you all to the first IKNS Conversations That Matter event uh, of the new year. We're excited about this new year as it's, uh, it's a special year for us. With its official launch in 2011, this is the 10th year of our program, uh, which actually makes us one of the longest running programs here at Columbia University School of Professional Studies. Uh, and as we start this new year, we're pleased to continue the IKNS Conversations That Matter series. This is the uh, Conversations That Matter is a series of public education events that bring thinkers, doers, and experts of the IKNS community together uh, with a broader audience of curious minds from uh, across Columbia University and beyond. Uh, these conversations tackle topics that are not only timely and relevant, but also at the core of the, IK the information and knowledge strategy discipline. My name is Michael Karboyak. I'm the Associate Director of Administration for this program. Um, if at any point, uh, you know, during the program or after, uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about IKNS. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'm going to kick it over to Katrina Pugh, uh, one IKNS lecturer and former academic director of the program. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you, Michael. It's wonderful to see everybody from so many different corners of the world. Welcome to the current students, welcome to the alumni, welcome to community members, welcome to faculty. It is wonderful to see you. I'm also super pleased to see a number of people from the Knowledge Management for Dev, the KM for Dev community of practice. Um, so I am also super thrilled to have Arno Borsma here who will be doing a fireside chat with me, a conversation that matters. And thank you for the intro. Yes, Michael, I am a lecturer in the program and currently I'm teaching a course called Networked Work. And you're gonna learn a lot about networks today. Um, Arno, you told me this morning that I had to try to pronounce the name of the town where you're in, which is outside The Hague. I'm gonna do my best, Servigna. No, not even close. Okay, let's hear it from you. And let's also hear a little bit about what you're experiencing today on the second day or the first full day, for second day after the inauguration and the first full day of the um, administration of um, Biden. Hi, Kate, and uh, hi, everyone around the world. We, we, we were live for about 15 minutes before we started, so we, we saw people join us from all around the world. So it, it's really great to... Uh, to join you today. And um, I know it's a fireside chat. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's a virtual one, um, but um, let's uh, really try to make this a conversation that that matters. Like like um, Kate says, I'm calling in from The Hague, recently moved back to the Netherlands from Washington DC. And it's actually a town, the beach town of The Hague called Scheveningen. Kate was trying to pronounce it, uh, but it's, it's, it's actually quite difficult. Uh, and there's a little anecdote that during World War II, this is how the Dutch kind of exposed spies. We'd ask them to say the name of this town and only the Dutch can actually pronounce it correctly. And if you, if you didn't, then we'd know you're not, you know, you're not a Dutchman. You, you might be a spy or, or from somewhere else. So um, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice beach town um, uh, in, the, in the middle of, uh, of The Hague. So glad to join you. Um, I think you asked what my day was like. So I, I, I actually moved back to The Hague um, a few months ago after living in DC for about 13 years. Um, main driver was getting the kids back into school. Schools were open in the Netherlands and my, my kids speak Dutch. So um, that was kind of an easy choice. The schools were still closed in DC. And, um, and, um, and of course, uh, you mentioned the new administration. Interestingly enough, and I think we'll talk a, a little bit more about small island states, but um, a week after the last administration took office, um, I moved to Aruba to uh, work for the UN. And of course, a lot of people uh, in DC actually, they, you know, they looked at me and said, are you kidding me? You, you're leaving us, you know, and, and the previous administration wasn't the most popular in, at least in Washington DC, but they said, you're leaving us now? For Aruba, um, anyway. So it was interesting, and then and then just now with the the, pre, the new administration, um, I moved back here, and I had to watch it from abroad. And I do think it's these are exciting times for for people in international development. Of course, if you look at, um, I believe Biden already signed about seventeen executive orders. Uh, uh, you know, rejoining the Paris Agreement, rejoining WHO, 
his economic recovery plan is is full of sustainability elements, um, carbon zero uh, ambitions before 2050. Um, so I think it's it's exciting times, and um, I think uh, it'll be very interesting to watch how that how that evolves. But uh, uh, this time I had to watch from afar the inauguration. Um, but um, I think I think yeah, it's uh, I'm very hopeful. On this second Good. Day. Well, I I think we are too, and we think that a more global outlook and a more sustainable outlook outlook make a suitable setting for this conversation right now. So. Arno has had a long conversation with the IKNS program going back to its inception. Arno, I think you were even a speaker in that very, very first class that we ran in 2011. I don't know if you remember that. Then I dragged you into a capstone. You were one of the capstone co sponsors while you were with the World Bank. You've spoken in a number of classes, including the networked work class. And it's been just wonderful to see your journey, your connection to the small island developing states and your work in networks. And I think it's gonna be really exciting to continue to learn from you as you're out there on the ground, in the water, on the, on the sea, on the beach, doing this, this type of work. So I'm very, very excited about that. I think it would be really nice for you to kind of give the group a little bit about your background with the program and your background, your background writ large. Sure. No, no. And, and, and it's, it's true. We, I think, Kate, you and I met uh, while we were both doing work at the World Bank. And um, I also remember I'm always I'm always very impressed by people who have written books because I somehow uh, just can't get myself to sit down and, and write, although, uh, you know, writing a book has been on my bucket list for for decades. So, um, and I know Kate, you have, you, you wrote that book, uh, you know, sharing hidden know-how, which uh, was all about knowledge jams. And um, I always found that very impressive. And it might be good also to mention, I think many people on the call might be familiar with the event that we did a few times, uh, Kate uh, and another colleague at the World Bank, Nisham Spitzberg, called Knowledge on a Mission, where we invited uh, high level uh, knowledge management people, like the, the chief knowledge officer of NASA and of the Olympics. And uh, we basically asked them, what, you know, what, what is your challenge? What, what can we help you solve? And we used the whole knowledge jam um, design that Kate was leading um, uh, to actually help these high level uh, folks uh, solve their issues. I, I always liked, um, like how that happened, I think we did it about three times, um, hosted by the IFC in DC. And, and I think many on the call might have actually attended that. So um, so that's, and, and then indeed, um, having spoken, and I remember speaking for your course um, about networks last time, it was all about my work and I'll elaborate a little bit more on connecting small islands uh, around the world as they face similar challenges. Um, but also in, in Ed Hoffman, who was CEO of, of NASA at the time, at his course on creating knowledge strategies. So um, yeah, I always have fond memories, especially also of the of the students, and they're uh, you know they're quite curious and uh, often have tough questions. But uh, no fond memories of IKNS, definitely. Well, one of the things that has been exciting for the two of us is. We've stepped into the international development world, both of us, from having worked in the private sector. Um, you worked for Heineken and L'Oreal. Um, I work for JP Morgan and Intel. And both of us have brought many different skills around knowledge sharing and networks, leadership management from those worlds. And we've not looked back, but we still have brought something with us. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so indeed, um, one of my first jobs is, was for L'Oreal, which is um, obviously all about, um, well, a lot about marketing, about trying to figure out what consumers need, uh, sometimes even before they know that they need it, and communicate it in a way that changes their behavior. And I think that is something I learned, uh, same thing at Heineken. I mean, these are very marketing-driven companies which is something when you talk about knowledge management, a lot of those principles you can actually apply to knowledge management because a lot of, in my experience, uh, a lot of it is about change management. So how do you get people to change their behaviors? And um, I guess the first question is, you know, what makes people tick? 
and what's and, and, and they, they're going to ask themselves, you know, what's in it for me? And um, so no different than for uh, maybe I might exaggerate a little bit, but for them for a shampoo and, and, and nail polish, you know, how, how do you get people to really see the need and, and to actually buy into it? Um, same thing uh, when it comes to knowledge management. How do you get people to share? You know, very often knowledge is still power, even though, um, you know, it's very, uh, it, it, it's very hip and cool to say, no, you know, we should all share. And, and, and the more we share, the better, the, better we are, the better off we are. Reality in organizations um, is often still that knowledge is power. And the more you know, the, you know, the, the, higher, uh, the higher the chance of success. So I, I indeed, I, um, I, I took a lot of those principles of uh, working for the private sector, but also after that, I started my own firm, which I, um, I don't know how long I had, but I, I sold it when I moved to the US. And it, it has actually also taught, taught me while I worked for some of these larger bureaucracies is how you, uh, how you spend your money wisely and how you get the most uh, impact out of every euro or dollar. And um, so, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot, and especially when it comes to building networks um, and getting the most impact out of knowledge, I think we can learn a lot from the private sector. Yeah, that's important. And what I have discovered is that we've also in turn taught the private sector quite a bit from the journeys that we've been taking in the nonprofit sector, particularly in the knowledge space. So some of the stuff that we've learned about motivation, about engaging affect, engaging the heart, we've put that front and center into our knowledge design. Similarly, we're seeing that increasingly in the private sector, both as they organize networks inside organizations or across organizations, and as they look to engage employees in improving the life of the organization and improving their own productivity. Um, so really, really helpful. But now I want you to tell me a little bit about Island Impact. So you worked for L'Oreal, you worked for Heineken, you had your own consulting firm, you worked for the World Bank, you had this opportunity, maybe you can tell us more about this, with the U UN, the UN Development Program to do something interesting with Small Island States. Tell us that next chapter. Right. So, um, so indeed, I was at the World Bank and working mostly in knowledge and innovation management, but then in, in very often in, in sustainable development sectors, so sectors that were part of the sustainable development network within the bank. And then um, it so happened that a, uh, an interesting uh, opportunity came along, which was setting up a center of excellence for small island states um for the un and this was the, the the purpose was to make sure that that uh, good practices lessons learned uh, from small island states were shared across and I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more why that is even more important than maybe uh, larger countries so um um and it was an it was an interesting combination because it was it was indeed a project uh within uh, funded by the kingdom of the netherlands um, which, which meant that it would be housed on one of the, uh, one of the islands, uh, one of the countries, which is part of the, uh, the kingdom. So it, it, it was Aruba and it was run by UNDP. So, I mean, um, I mean, I don't know about you, but the combination between Aruba working for the UN and, uh, creating something of a, of a knowledge center to me, that was like a dream come true. Like all my, all my, um, all the, all the, it was a crossroads of all my, uh, all the vectors aligning, all the, all the passions and, and it came together, beautiful, beautiful country, great weather, nice people. And then, and then, you know, helping small islands around, around the world. So I, um, uh, I had experience in sustainable development, but not necessarily small islands. I mean, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I know some are calling, I, I know that so there's someone calling in from Hawaii, but so some people are calling in from, from islands, but um, I mean, I don't know how many people know where Tuvalu or Vanuatu or, you know, a lot of these, these islands are, are actually at. So I, I had a, uh, I started this, um, this work, setting up this center of excellence for all these small island states around the world uh, based on Aruba and uh, did a crash course on, um, of course, on these islands, because they're, they're not always, uh, you know, at the, at the top of the radar in, in, in world politics and in world news. 
but uh, but a fascinating uh, a fascinating challenge because they um, the small islands are at the uh, you know they're they're kind of the the canaries canaries in the coal mine of how we deal with the climate uh, climate around the world the way we treat as a global community the way we treat and the way we 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 help these uh, smaller countries in their sustainable development is kind of uh, it's kind of very telling on how we treat the, uh, how we treat the planet because you have um, these these smaller countries that definitely um, are not to blame for most of the climate uh, you know for most of the climate change global warming and all its its consequences but they do bear the brunt they are the first to really notice especially in the pacific there are some countries that uh, you know, within a few decades, it might not be there because of uh, rising sea levels. And so, um, to me, it was a, it was a very, um, uh, very fascinating, and but also a important combination be between the sense of urgency on the one hand, in helping um, uh, this the, these knowledge flows to to kind of improve the sustainability development. But on the other hand, on a more personal level, these are fabulous places to visit to to work from. Um, and also to actually show impact because the scale is often smaller. Uh, the impact you can have is uh, can can often, relatively speaking, can often be larger. In other words, you do what you do. You do a, an awareness campaign. It's it's not impossible to reach the whole country within a week, right? I mean, try that in any any larger country. But um, um, so uh, that's kind of how I evolved from, um, you know, working in knowledge management and um, and uh, sustainable sustainable development, and then focusing on these small island developing states, whom I think could also um, actually inspire the world. I mean, some of the things happening there can be very um, interesting for um, for the rest of the world. So. Um, yeah, happy to elaborate. I mean, I could talk for hours about yeah, this, but yeah, uh, it's uh, well, what I what I loved was what you were saying about how they are um, they are small enough that you can have an impact, but I would also say they're small enough that they exist as a system, and you and I have spoken about that. You aren't just stepping in and saying let's address plastic waste or let's address climate change and sea level rise or let's address livelihoods. You have to address all those things concurrently and you've raised that to my attention and I find that also a very useful lesson for us as we look at the rest of the world and other situations where it's too easy to get very sort of provincial or isolated in a single discipline. Talk a little yeah, bit about that. Would you? Well, uh, well, it's interesting you say that about islands, but this is this is also exactly how I was reading up on on you know Biden's uh, strategy. This is this one of the things that people commend him for is that he's actually approaching it in combination. It's not just the pandemic; it's also climate change, it's the economy, it's 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 um, um, equality, it's racism, and he's actually looking at it in in, in combination and not in silos. So um, it's nice to see that that's happening on on on, on many levels, but. Um, it, it is true. What, what's interesting, um, and, and I think anyone, everyone on the call has obviously knows about islands. At a minimum, you know how, how you know, the, at a minimum, you know that these are these, you know, little paradises with beautiful beaches and beautiful nature. But um, of course, these are these are these are countries with their uh, with their unique challenges. I'll give you one example. The um, so I was with, living on Aruba, which is one of the most tourism dependent countries in the world. 90%, just about 90% of, um, of their GDP is tourism dependent. So you can imagine when, when, when COVID uh, came and, and there were no flights, no cruise ships, um, that uh, makes you very, very vulnerable uh, to, uh, to these type of economic shocks. So, um, and this is what made it also interesting from a network perspective and a knowledge management perspective is that uh, a lot of these challenges uh, were similar, be it Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, or um, the Pacific. Uh, the um, you know the lack of economic diversity um, one you know is one of the big challenges. How can you create new economic sectors? How can you create really a, a kind of a blue ocean economy? Uh, and others were um, things like import. So a lot of the energy and a lot of the food is imported. 
and take just those two. I mean, um, uh, a lot of these countries have a lot of wind and a lot of sun. So why, um, and again, I'm, I'm explaining it at a more abstract level, you know, on the ground, these are not easy, uh, easy uh, challenges to tackle. But if you have a lot of sun and wind, and even geothermal or ocean, ocean wave energy, why not tap into that instead of importing all these fossil fuels? Um, same thing with um, agriculture, you know, um, very often when people fly into as tourists fly into these these countries, they don't realize that the, the food that they're going to eat is actually in this on the same plane, right? You have, uh, you know, you might have all the hamburgers in, uh, in, in the cargo section, and you're sitting uh, up there. You don't know that you're actually bringing your own food, and you you'll stay at the, the Marriott or the Hyatt. And um, so, one of the other challenges is how can you create a a local um, uh, local uh, agricultural sector, which you know again is a, is a big challenge, but it's not impossible. So. These are some of the challenges that actually go across uh, the world when you look at um, at these uh, uh, small island uh, developing states. And there, there are more. There are things like um, the fact that um, a lot of the um, a lot of the, the the younger generation they go abroad to study. They don't always come back. Um, they don't they don't always come back uh, because that there's not always enough opportunity. So how can you create? Um, great ideas to bring them back and in, invest in their in their own country. So um, anyway, so a lot of challenges. And the interesting thing is there's a there's kind of a common thread around the world. And and I think knowledge management, and which is why. So I went um, uh, I went to Aruba to set up this this center of excellence for for UNDP is to make sure that these best practices and, and the lesson were shared because um, um, because since um, since the resources were limited, it's even more important not to reinvent the wheel, right? It, 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 it's very important to find out what have others done, not make those mistakes, and then to implement them. And um, anyway, so that was, uh, that was definitely a fascinating, uh, a fascinating journey. And you've got me just, my gut, I've got ideas sort of buzzing in my head because each one of those themes both all the issues that were related to the conditions of the islands and knowledge sharing really give us an opportunity to start talking about networks. So we both know that networks are groups of people crossing organizational boundaries to co-create the opportunities that they couldn't do alone. That often involves sharing knowledge and co-creating different knowledge objects or different kinds of products together. And what I'm hearing is there is a shared fate for each of these different islands. They are experiencing the exodus of young people. They are experiencing scarcity. They are experiencing opportunity. And it just might be that it's not efficient for them to go and innovate along those lines individually. And I would also say that they have a shared faith. Many of them also believe very, very deeply in their indigenous heritage, in the sacredness of their land. And the fact that they are not going to just simply abandon the island until they do all the work to make it sustainable. Tell us a little bit about how you thought about the idea of networks as an important tool in your toolkit to get those solutions from your center of excellence. Well, I, I like that you mentioned indigenous knowledge because um, uh, maybe a little bit accelerated by um, by COVID, a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, countries have actually tapped back into their indigenous knowledge to see how things, for example, look at agriculture, uh, have gotten so used to importing things, but now with COVID, actually started looking at how did we, you know, how do we grow our own produce uh, decades ago. And trying to go back to that uh, that time because you know they 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 used to be when it came to food self sufficient and not have to import all of that. I think um, one thing also uh, two things to mention um, which were also important for the networking is uh, the the whole framework of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with with those, about five years ago, just about every country in the world agreed to these seventeen goals which cover just about anything to improve our planet from energy to water to equality. Um, what's nice about that uh, framework also from a networking perspective is that it's, it, it has created a common language. 
So SDG, Sustainable Development Goal number seven is about energy. It's about renewable energy, clean energy, which means that everyone around all the countries and governments around the world, they know SDG seven is, uh, you know, is about energy. And others, are, like I said, others about other topics, but it, it has created a common language uh, across the world. And I think, um, I think that the, the United Nations, and of course, all, all the member countries have done that very well. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's a great way and it's a great facilitator of networking. The other thing I, I, I also want to mention is the whole idea of the triple helix or the, maybe the quadruple helix, but always to make sure that it's not only government or it's not only private sector or NGOs or knowledge institutions, but um, that um, when it comes to networking and solving these solutions, it's always all those players together. Um, we wrote a few case studies on um, on some some uh, good examples that were happening. One one was on renewable energy. I remember uh, this was about implementing renewable energy uh, on, uh, on one of the islands, which was uh, wind power. And um, it was clear that all the plan. It was clear that there were very ambitious goals on the one hand uh, from politicians, and there were, and then there were engineers who actually had to implement it. Um, who said, you know, it's too ambitious. That's not going to happen. And it, it was stalled for a few years until they actually sat at the same table and they started discussing, um, you know, where are the barriers, what are the possibilities. So that is also, uh, that's also very common on uh, when it comes to finding those solutions is, is that until you, you, you sit at the same table and speak that same language, um, it's going to be very hard to, um, to uh, you know, to, to move ahead. Um, but indeed, um, um, what we saw is that uh, we created a lot of case studies whenever we saw something that was that was going well be it as uh, uh, for example a, a great hotel in sustainable uh, tourism for example or um, like marine protected areas we made sure that we captured that and then shared it with uh, for the benefit of all the other countries so that they you know they that they could apply it uh, accordingly now i'm starting to hear the secret sauce of that network that you called the center of excellence Earlier in our conversation today, you mentioned you had five critical success factors that you brought to bear while you were doing that work. Can you remind me what your five critical success factors are for networks? Sure, um, sure, I can, and it, I think it's I think it's um, and it's not it's not specific to this. I've actually uh, through um, uh, failures and successes kind of figured these five out, which whenever I do a project, I, I kind of try and take those into account. So they are, one is to think big, but then start small. So, you know, when you, when you, when you look at your, um, your plans, your programs, uh, on the one hand, think big, be extremely ambitious, but then go back to, you know, what is the first step and keep it, keep it manageable. The second one I actually uh, mentioned already is the what's in it for me question. So if you know who you're trying to help, um, try and get into their shoes or their head. But anyway, try and answer that question. Uh, why would someone um, do what you're trying to get them to do? So what's in it for me? And so get the answer to that question. And it's it's trickier than you think because people, um, they, they, they don't always say what they do and they don't always do what they say. It's It's... So, but it is good to see uh, and to maybe to observe behavior uh, because behavior is always the best indicator of, of you know, how people uh, might react. So that's the second one, answer that what's in it for me question. The third one is to show tangible results. And I've learned that also the hard way because knowledge management can be very fluffy, very abstract. So um, um, it's important to show very concretely how has it benefited. I, um, there was one example where um, I was doing a workshop and I uh, threw in the question, this was for a, a, a large organization about the subscription. So I said, okay, who, who in this room, there are about 20 people, who has a subscription to XYZ? And it turned out that there were like five people that had, that had the same subscription, paying for that same subscription uh, every year. Whereas of course it was one organization, one would have been enough. So uh, that was an easy way to say, okay, you know, you can end four of those um, and then use this one subscription across the enterprise. And we've actually just saved money. So this is, you know, it's a very tangible way to show that if you guys, you know, if everyone just shares what they, uh, what they know, you can save money. Um, the, the fourth one is um, that it's, it's about people. And sometimes we tend to forget about, um, 
um, because there's so many interesting tools around. Um, the the technology is, is usually much more tangible than the people you're dealing with, right? So um, I've often seen the investments in technology and say, okay, we're, we're you know we're moving ahead. So um, uh, just don't forget, it's it's usually about people, both both on the success as the as the um, the failure side. If you look at failures of projects in, in knowledge management and, and, and also the networking part, it's usually because um, people um, have resisted or uh, don't, don't get it or they don't get what you're trying to, to achieve or you're not tapping into their needs. Um, so take that into account because that's, uh, if you don't, you're gonna, you're gonna run into it uh, sooner or later. And the last one is, is, is start with what you have uh, so that's the fifth one, um, by which I mean, uh, especially if you're in large organizations, um, my experience is that uh, someone has already done it or someone has already invested in, in, in the solution or part of the solution. So, you know, drink a lot of coffee with people. I mean, it's a bit difficult now that we're, you know, all online and virtual, but um, especially in large organizations, I've often seen that uh, it's, it's the solution is out there somewhere. Uh, you just have to find the right person who... Um, uh, who has solved it. And um, so before you really start investing in, in new stuff, make sure you understand what's, what's, what's already available. And maybe not even within the organization, maybe, you know, look outside, look at what partners are doing, uh, partner organizations or, or experts, um, which is why I think um, networking is so important because I think nine, nine times out of 10, the solution is out there, but you just need to find the kind of the problem solver. That is excellent. So I'm going to summarize quickly and I'm going to make a re remark because a lot of people who have taken the networked work course or the collaboration course with me will see some amazing synergies. Think big, start small. Um, be clear on what's in it for me. N understand why the participants are motivated to be present and what they're going to get out of it. Observe behavior, so understand what people are doing and what they could be doing. Um, show tangible results, which probably means hold a mirror to the successes, right? Um, and it's about people, so understand that there are individual needs and there might be individual actions that need to be noticed, recognized, and informed. Um, and then start with what you have. And I think that's kind of interesting because that makes a kind of wonderful, you know, kind of coda because you started with think big, start small. Um, I, I love that. And it's interesting too, as I study networks and I'm delighted to see that Larry Prusak joined, I understand even more than what Larry and I studied. In 2011, we did a large project for the Gates Foundation where we asked what enables networks to help further innovations around childhood and maternal nutrition. And what we did ultimately see is there needs to be a connection between the design, the dynamics of the group, what kinds of feedback loops are there, um, the behaviors and the outcomes. And increasingly I'm understanding that for me to be good at network design and network participation, I need to know a lot about behavioral psychology and I need to know a lot about social psychology. And so for those of you who are with us, who've taken even just your Psych 101, go and grab your books because it's happening. And know that this is not about putting together plans and templates and check boxes and checklists. This is much more about understanding the interactions of humans, the motivations of humans, things like choice architectures, you know, observability, all of the stuff that we've been studying, you know, with things like game theory and with, um, you know, social um, ecological systems, that's all coming into play. We as knowledge practitioners can have wonderful conversations with people in other fields like psychology. So this is really, really interesting. So you came to Aruba, you had a mandate to help start knowledge sharing and to create a center of excellence. And you did some amazing things with them. I mean, just, just imagining that conversation where you're looking around the room and you're saying, look, we're all buying the same thing multiple times. 
or look, that guy over there has done something innovative on the Maldives and here we are in Curacao and we've got to do the same thing. Um, I'm really interested in a project that you shared with me that sort of builds on some of those themes, which you called digital nomads. In fact, you didn't just share it with me. If you remember last summer during the networked work course, the students had had an introduction to networks, but you told them about your experience and then you challenged them. Tell us what you asked them and tell us the status of this construct of digital nomads. Sure. Um, so this kind of links back to what I, what I explained about the, um, the challenges, economic and otherwise, for, for small island states and the fact that now COVID came along and it was even, even, even tougher. Now the, the, the notion of digital nomads is obviously not new. There, there, there are a lot of people who, uh, I guess you could call them lucky, but they could travel the world. And uh, thanks to the way their uh, work is organized, often it's digital work, they can work from anywhere. Now, what became interesting as we um, uh, discussed this with, um, uh, with island governments is that um, it, the whole notion of if you can work any, uh, anywhere, right, which many of us can right now, uh, especially because uh, we're not just talking about digital nomads, but also remote workers, if you can work anywhere, why not on, uh, on a tropical island? And um, so the question I, I posed um, uh, in, in, in the course was, uh, so what would it take for you, you know, what would be, what would be, what it, would it take for you, and what would be the critical um, the conditions for you to actually move to to a tropical island and work from there? Uh, actually, it doesn't sound like much of a challenge <laughs> when I put it that way, but um, uh, the whole idea was that um, uh, how can you make that work? And the thing is that, uh, and we had a good discussion, but the whole concept was that you would go and work and there, there are now many islands aruba is one of them who launched a campaign called uh, one happy work workcation um and uh, but others like jamaica and antigua uh, bermuda the cayman islands um a lot of islands have said okay you know why don't we invite these uh, these folks if they can work from anywhere let them work from uh, from these tropical islands uh, the, the main challenges are uh, taxes you don't want to be taxed twice and and then work permits you want to make sure that you're allowed to work, but it's it's a great uh, it's a great development that's happening now, and we got I got some great feedback from the students at the time on how also on how to expand this into kind of a buddy system. So if you have someone, say someone from Europe, will go and work on Curacao, um, um, have a buddy system with with uh, someone who's local, uh, who can then you know share the whole island experience. Whereas the person coming from Europe can, uh, you know, can uh, can share uh, whatever he's doing professionally, and that that way kind of creates a um, a local community of these uh, these digital workers. Um, you could even expand it even more. We just discussed uh, uh, briefly about the diaspora. So a lot of the a lot of the uh, people who would love to come back to their their countries, but uh, there might not be a lot of opportunities. If this is done well, you can even create a local ecosystem where it does become a lot more interesting to work from these places, also for people who are actually born there. So um, anyway, so we had a yeah we had a great discussion about uh, um, how we could promote digital nomads um, across, uh, you know, across these small island states, because it's, it's actually, I mean, it's perfect. The weather is, the weather's nice. It's beautiful. You can jump in the ocean just between, uh, you know, your Zoom calls, um, you know, who doesn't want to do that? So um, that was a lot of fun. And this is, this, like I said, it's actually being spread out around the world. More and more countries are, are now looking into um, or have already launched these programs for remote workers. And an exciting piece that you also raised was that they're collaborating. The different small island developing states are creating situations where they're using coherent structures, they're using taxation models that have some similarities. So they're not setting each other up to be competitors. They're setting themselves up to be destinations collectively. And that's just a miracle of the networks that you initiated while you were there on Curacao. Um, very, very exciting. We are, wow, we are getting some great questions in the chat. One last little topic I wanted to go to before we jump to those questions. 
are, um, I wanted to see if you'd be willing to talk a bit about how you're bringing the SIDS together in the context of plastic removal or plastic waste writ large. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And SIDS, uh, for those who don't know, it's, it's the acronym that's often used uh, within the UN system for small island developing states. Um, although we can also call them big ocean states. So for, for those who don't know, uh, uh, most small island states have about 80% or 80 times um, um, jurisdiction over water as opposed to land. So they have 80, 80 times more water than land. So it's actually, they're actually big ocean states. Um, but um, indeed, one thing we um, we started, and Kate has also been part of that, is a, a new initiative called um, the uh, Commitment Accelerator for Plastic Pollution (CAP), which we started with uh, two others. So, in, you know, in the spirit of networking, another organization called um, Ocean Recovery Alliance, and another one called Front uh, Frontline Waste. And Ocean Recovery Alliance had done a study of, um, of uh, a few hundred commitments to fight plastic pollution. And they actually looked at the successful ones, ones that had uh, more impact, some had less impact, some were maybe dormant, but these were all commitments from different types of organizations that had a common goal, get less plastic into the ocean. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, there's about every minute, there's a, there's a, about every minute, there's a garbage truck of plastic being dumped into the ocean. So um, it's, 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 it's pretty, it's pretty awful. And it's, it's a huge problem. Um, so what we said, um, that this small group uh, that we were, we said, what if we can help based on this study that Ocean Recovery Alliance had done? What if we can help uh, those commitment makers who have the best intentions to be more successful based on this study? So we uh, we launched that, and I um, I convinced the others that let's start with um, with working and collaborating with um, uh, three island states from around the world that to cover the whole planet, kind of as launching partners. So that's Curacao in the Caribbean, that's the Seychelles in the Indian Ocean, and that's Fiji in um, in uh, in the Pacific. And uh, so the idea, what we will be doing is um, is working with existing commitments. Uh, to help them improve um, with with expertise which they may not have always incorporated, like all the network and community expertise that Kate brings, um, and um, so that's what we will be doing. And it was it was already very interesting to have those three islands on the same call. Um, obviously, it was a nightmare in terms of time time zones, right? Because um, this is literally the entire the whole globe. world, the, the entire globe. But they were, you know, they, they, to give you an example, they each have a task force on, ta on plastic pollution and uh, as, as a lot of countries have. And so they were already sharing a lot of ideas, you know, in, in the initial call before we even really launched. But um, so this is something, it's CAP, you can look it up at cap.global, which um, I'm, I'm collaborating with, uh, with Kate and the others to really uh, try and help, you know, make a dent into this huge problem uh, of this plastic uh, in the ocean, uh, which is, um, um, yeah, which, which needs to be solved. And, and, and there's obviously there's many working on, on this topic uh, too that, uh, that, that I, I really like. Well, they're also very close, they're Dutch. One is uh, the, the, the ocean cleanup, which has, um, you know, looking at, they were, they were trying to, um, or are, are trying to uh, get rid of the big um, uh, plastic patch which is floating in the Pacific. And another one I uh, a few months ago I saw called uh, bubble I think it was a bubble barrier, which is a very ingenious one. It's it's bubbles. They basically it's it's like a barrier of bubbles that float up, which will basically because of the bubbles will collect all the trash coming down the river. It's very smart because it doesn't affect uh, uh, the fish or wildlife and uh, if you have a boat you can just keep going but anyway so there's a lot happening in in that space but uh it's been very exciting to uh to work with the team and uh and now with the three uh, uh the three islands um on the moving this forward so is, and maybe just yeah sorry go ahead i was going to say what's been so fascinating as you said they discovered that they all had task forces they also discover that they are all doing bag bans. You know, they're they're getting rid of single use bags and they're all enacting cleanup initiatives and they're all doing set asides of certain parts of wildlife near, near the beaches and near the waterfronts. And what's been 
incredibly valuable is they're starting to, as you said before, develop a common vocabulary, discover that there is cross island learning that can take place. Their methodologies, there could even be templates that they could use. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about the kinds of outcomes these guys are gonna realize. Yeah, and, and even even if they don't, if they're not at the same stage, like one one country might be working with drones to to you know to look at plastic pollution in the ocean, and where the and other might be might be thinking um, about how to start that and and what software to use. So it's 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 very interesting also when when they're actually at different levels where they can pull, you know, pull each other up. Um, and maybe just to mention it for people who are very interested in, in these uh, small island um, uh, challenges and solutions, there are three, there are three good organizations that I, I, I'm, I'm always very impressed by. One is, one is from a friend, James Ellsmore. It's called Island Innovation. And um, he's doing a lot also in terms of virtual, a virtual conference, connecting island professionals. Uh, so check that out. There's uh, the Global Island Partnership, GLISPA. Um, Kate Brown is doing a lot of good work connecting islands. Uh, something more, I mean, I'm more at a political level. There's a lot of political um, uh, support, um, but really making a lot of changes. And then um, uh, I, I was at the UNDP. The UNDP is also doing a lot to help sustainable development of, um, of, of islands. So if you, know, if you Googled those three, you'll see incredible videos, case studies, uh, and, and projects if you really want to dive into that more. Even if it's and just because you you know you want to go work on on, on a nice uh, nice beach. Uh, nice so beach. So. We all want to be digital nomads. Um, right. I also would add that I'm speaking to you now from Maine. Maine has the most mileage of coastline for all the contiguous U.S. states, and we have the highest impact to our coastline by global warming of any state in the union. So we're seeing temperature rises that are unprecedented. The Island Institute is based in Maine and the Island Institute Arno introduced me to. So I have to go to The Hague to meet somebody who lives 10 miles down the road here, right? Thank you for doing that. So they are also very interested in the same concerns even while the islands here are not unique nations Many of them have the same kinds of problems, and we all know sea rise is impacting the economy as well as just the experience of being in Maine. So, well, Arno, this has been amazing, and now I can just see we are just booming with questions here. Any, I was going to say, any questions come in? I, I mean, I'm not looking at <laughs> yes, the chat. Yes, lots so, of uh... questions. Um, so, M Michael and I will will start doing some some asking, and um, I'm. I'm hoping that I, um, I'm not missing too many. We'll ask one from the chat and then um, it'd be wonderful to hear people come off mic, come off mute and come onto their mic. Um, so one really kind of poignant question was, how do you know when you're getting these outcomes? What are some of the signals that you're getting? You said how important it was to show tangible results one of the people is asking is, what kinds of tangible results were you seeing? What kinds of measurable impacts? And maybe how did you set the network up so that you were clear on how you would be measuring? Excellent question. Um, sometimes it's easy. You mentioned plastic bag bands, right, uh, Kate? Well, that's something you can very easily measure by, by just by driving around. And within a year, you'll see a lot less, pra a lot less plastic uh, along the road. Um, very often when you deal with, with behavior of people, it's a little bit more difficult, um, uh, because I, I, I know in my, in my work as, uh, in, in many KM projects, I, I personally don't think it's enough when, uh, you count downloads of documents, for example, or have people read things. I mean, that's one way to measure things, but that's, that's, that's still consumption that hasn't, that hasn't really changed. That, that hasn't necessarily changed behavior of people. So I think um, it, it, it totally depends on your specific um, situation, but there are ways to, to measure um, either tangible, like I just mentioned with, the, with plastic bags, uh, bands or uh, clean beaches or, um, um, but, um, um, and, and sometimes when it- Like tonnage, sorry? tonnage that has been tonnage. removed from the supply chain. Yeah. Right, because if yeah. you're banning things, yeah. Very so it's good. it's 
it's it's um, it kind of depends because sometimes you want to lower costs. Well, that's very easy to uh, in a in a way easy to measure, or you um, want to create a uh, higher output, which is also easy to me easier to measure. Um, but often uh, within large organizations, uh, the 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 way to measure it, which is a bit imperfect, is through surveys and just to ask people. You know, have you have you used this knowledge? Has it what has it brought? Has it changed? Uh, you know, uh, changed the way you behave or act? Um, but um, yes, totally. I mean, it is a very important aspect, and I, I would say you know you can measure success if you. I mean, you can't call it a success if you haven't actually measured it and have to show evidence in something tangible. Yeah, good yes. point. And we all know as knowledge practitioners is that frequently there's something upstream, there's an antecedent to that tangible outcome. So a priori, you might be measuring the number of commitments that you have where people are being very articulate on the tonnage that they're going to reduce, or they're very articulate on the number of leaders they're going to be bringing to the, the network, you know, so those are sort of the antecedents, the upstream things, and then those outcomes and impacts are measured in environmental impact. I'm going to jump to a question in the chat because I do actually see another question, which is, um, so when you're working in a network, there are a lot of knowledge products. Are there some knowledge products that you guys created that you think are really salient, ones that you think, hmm, I'm going to put that on my checklist the next time I bring people together. In fact, we might be doing that with CAP. So what I, yeah, I mean, there are various, but I think the first, first part of the answer is that what I noticed across, um, uh, across all the things we created is that people, uh, first of all, people are, uh, have information overload, right? They are too, they're, they're extremely busy, and especially the, the target group I was working for mostly was policymakers in governments on, on small island states who, will, who often have huge portfolios. They might be responsible for energy and water and infrastructure. So um, basically the common thread, people wanted to know what others had done to solve their issues. Uh, what was the checklist and uh, what could they take from what others had done and apply it, for their own, uh, apply it to their own situation? So um, people wanted practical knowledge that they could apply. That was, that was kind of a common thread. Now, um, we had about 10 different kind of channels in which we could share that, right? You, you can have newsletters, you can have webinars, you can have uh, in-person events, um, uh, you could write a case study. Um, so, but what we did first was to actually determine what is the type of knowledge and what are the topics that are most uh, in need. I mentioned there are 17 sustainable development goals. Um, they're all important, but some are more important than others uh, or more urgent. So, um, so one of the first things we did, and this is actually also one of the one of the the, the the challenges we tackled at one of these knowledge on a mission events, is um, how do you how do you kind of filter to the knowledge that people really are are really waiting for? So, um, I think that is the first one. The second part, which is kind of ironic since everything is virtual now, when we had, whenever we did a survey, not just for our, the center of actions, but, but uh, any knowledge management uh, uh, survey, the, the, the more the people were involved, like pe person to person events, the more popular they were. So if you would ask them, you know, how do you want to share knowledge? It's, you know, the person to person is always number one. And then all the way at the bottom, probably some kind of a document repository. But um, uh, so what we did is uh, make sure that we, focus more on getting the knowledge that was most practical and actionable for, for people, and then kind of use all those different channels to make sure that it, it, it reached the target audience. And um, which in a way is quite successful because the same knowledge can then, you know, be part of the webinar, which then becomes a blog, which you put in your newsletter, which then can become an element of your online learning course. So it just kind of flows through all those, uh, all those uh, building blocks. That's a very, very good point. Now, What's interesting is you just dovetailed into a question that Janetta asked, which is how do we prevent ourselves from over-indexing towards the technology? In fact, a lot of us are feeling overwhelmed with Zoom to Zoom to Zoom, we get Zoomitis and we're living on these, you know, these machines every single day. Um, how do you, um, 
how do you re-index back to the conversation when you do have to work in a virtual sense? Are there some tips that you would share with a group as you're working with networks? What are the ways that you bring the network back to the conversation? Um, yeah, like I said, it, 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 yeah, it's it's obviously not ideal, right? But but I think the more you can mimic uh, like real life on on these virtual platforms, the better it is. So like like today, it's called a conversation, right? Uh, so uh, I'm not presenting. There was not one slide shown. It's a conversation, it's open, people can interrupt, it's maybe a little bit messy, but so it, it kind of really mimics the, the way you and I, Kate, might be having a coffee uh, in, in downtown DC. So uh, I think that's one. The other thing is maybe to add a, a fun element into, um, into the, um, the connection. So it doesn't always have to be very serious, but um, there could be some fun, that, you know, there should be some laughter. Um, but I think that would be my general you know, high level advice. Try and try and um, not make it just like a, 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 a PowerPoint, you know, death by PowerPoint and just uh, all these abstract uh, uh, frameworks or whatever, you know, keep it, try, try and bring examples, try and um, use storytelling, you know, use stories to, um, to, to provide the evidence. Um, yeah, I mean, those are all just little ways in which you can make it more, um, more a pleasure, uh, you know, more, more pleasurable, and 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 also the the, the idea of you know showing showing your uh, your face. So um, I had a call the other day when 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 only the manager was the only one on screen, and she, at a certain point she actually said, "Why am I the only one, you know, showing my screen?" And then everyone <laughs> turned it on, and it but it, be, it became a, a very different meeting because, uh, you know, people uh, you couldn't see people before. So, and you said. It's about the people. Right. And I'm grateful that you made me try to pronounce, say it again. The so name of this, this is like Dina. So even Hay though Hay I have Dutch people around me in my family, I've never been able to pronounce that G. Even when I try to buy cheese, I can't say Gouda very well. So um, that humor was a wonderful way of kind of, well, I don't know, making it clear that I'm not a spy but I'm, right. I wanna be one, I wanna play one on TV. Um, so thank you so much for today's conversation. We've learned a heck of a lot about the plight of the small island developing states. We've learned some really practical tips about managing a network, getting network outcomes, focusing the network activity. We've even gotten sort of some intrigue, I can just see it in the chat around digital nomads. And we've got a lot of enthusiasm about learning more around the plight of the small island developing states and how you did the centering work on their priorities. So thank you everybody for coming. I'm happy to see that there are 19 diehard people who are still here at 10 minutes past the hour. I hope that you continue to stay plugged in. You continue to participate in our conversations that matter. You get to know the IKNS program. If you're interested in joining us, we'd love to have you part of it. Also, if you're in the IKNS program or one of the sibling programs in the School of Professional Studies, know that we'd love to have you in the networked work course. We'll have Arno back there and more stories to tell, and I'll be leading it, and it will be starting in early July. Thanks, everyone.